Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us uh, for this afternoon's webinar. And I am delighted to introduce to you uh, Professor Johanne Sundby, who on behalf of the Center for Global Health at the University of Oslo will talk to you about different aspects related to how to be successful in your academic career. So please, Professor Johanne, I am so privileged to have you and welcome you to this webinar, please. Thank you, and here I am. And my assumption is that you are somebody who's almost finished your PhD or you have finished your PhD and graduated and you are thinking, what next? then I'm going to look at the different types of skills that you may have or may need to acquire uh, during uh, your next steps to become a highly rec uh, recognized academicians, academician in the future. So let's go to my slides. So the first skill you need to be aware of is, of course, related to your writing. You already have learned how to write through your process as a PhD student. And Hopefully you've always already published papers and uh, that of course have taught you that scientific writing is a specific culture. It's not like writing a novel, but you may have learned the basic rules to follow the outlines, not to write too much, not to be too vague, to be precise, not to use heavy language and say too much and not to conclude with issues that you haven't covered. But you also need some of those other skills in writing popular science, because that's something researchers are often poor at. They say uh, the so-called uterus and the so-called uh, cancer. But you need to be able to write popular science with simplified messages, like, for instance, only the conclusion, without a lot of scientific detail. Because uh, conclusion hits people's curiosity and it changes people's knowledge. So. Be, be aware that you need to be able to write. And here is a fun slide which says something about uh, the anatomy of a scientific paper. And uh, it is kind of just uh, an outline which is uh, more like a joke, but it is fun to read it. So you can take a closer look at it afterwards uh, because here it's only about examining colors. Uh, of course, you, you need to communicate. You need to talk to people. You can't just sit in your office and talk to yourself. And communication skills apply to how you present your study to a diverse audience. Some of them are scientific and are critical. And some are implementers and they want to know what to do. And some are policymakers and they want to know what to say. And some are just ordinary people that are curious or maybe they're just listening because they're listening. So you need to modify your messages according to who you speak to. Like you, when you speak to a scientist, maybe they want to look at the method. And when you speak to a policymaker, they want to know the conclusion. And don't think that your findings are the most important in the world, though they are important. And uh, don't think that findings are non-questionable, but be proud of your efforts. Say, this is what I found, and I think so. so. Communication, of course, can be oral, like I'm talking to you now. It can be in the media online as a columnist. I've been a columnist for 10 years in the newspaper or as a, as a popular science writer, like you write blogs or a textbook chapter or you write a book, whatever. It, it needs to be something that you think about, communicate. And here I am communicating as a, a clown because I also like to have some fun. So when students are examined, I sometimes have an alter ego, which is more clowny than I am in my daily life. Now, one way of communicating is to go to the media. Media today is broader than we used to. Before media was radio, TV and newspapers. Now, uh, media is uh, also social media of all, all kinds. And you know that even presidents use social media to communicate. Uh, maybe he's not that skilled, the American one. But anyway, uh, media skills are about being able to handle journalists. Sometimes journalists are a bit stupid and sometimes they're very, very knowledgeable, but they exist in newspapers, in radio and in debates. And sometimes they wanna confront you rather than to have a dialogue. So they may have their own logic. And often the journalists want to run the show. 
then you may also be somebody who runs the show. And my media strategy has always been that I would like to, to, to run and set the agenda myself. And therefore I'm quite open to media, but uh, don't let them make you change your messages. If, if you oppose to what interpretation they have of your message then go back and say, but oh, that's not what I mean. I mean this, and that is very important too. Working with media, uh, when you offer them something is sometimes difficult, but it is possible to sell in your message. But if you earn a name as a good media communicator, like I actually have done, uh, after a while, you may experience that they will come to you and then you're much more free to communicate what you want. Now, here is your bread winning. You need to be a breadwinner in the country of science. You need to be able to write for grants and you need grant writing skills. The survival of you and other scientists lie in the ability to receive grants, that is to receive money. Uh, funding organizations are often interested in a diverse uh, list of uh, topics and they also said may have an agenda that they want you to research this or that, like now they want you to do COVID, but uh, you can, can also um, look at what they're saying in their, in their call for grant applications. And you have to formulate your own relevance, why you think what you provide is scientific excellence, that you have novel ideas, not ideas that thousand people have thought before you, you may want to go into the area of innovations, but that's not always uh, part of science. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. You need to be able to prove that you are able to carry out this type of project and you need to write a cookbook about how you're going to do it. So take salt and sugar and uh, stir it and fry it kind of uh, methodology. And you need to show that you can do projects by uh, pointing to your former publications and your former grants. Uh, grant writing is extremely competitive, so you really need to exercise the skill. Uh, make sure that the problem statement and review of the field is up to date. If all your articles are dated before 1950, then you are on the wrong side of science. You need to formulate objectives that are clearly written out and you only you need one sentence for each objective. If you lump them together, it's difficult to decipher. Uh, the methods you apply will uh, and should enable you to answer the objectives one by one. So you need to have the objectives and the methods and link the two. And then you need to put up a time schedule. Not that you need 30 years to get to a conclusion, maybe two, three years is more realistic. You cannot inflate your budget because you will most likely get less than what you ask for. So be careful about budgeting. And define your outcomes, especially the scientific outcomes that you are anticipating to get. And maybe even define the journals and the names of the articles that you're going to write, because that looks quite well thought through. It's always possible to change things afterwards, but uh, the people that write Proposals sometimes say they're going to do more than what the reviewers think that they will achieve. And that's why you need to be both modest and brave when you write proposals. But of course, once you have the grant, you need to be able to administer that grant. As a senior researcher, like I am, you need to be able to administer research projects. And that's a big thing to do. You need to be able to plan for data collection apply for ethics clearance, understand logistics, understand budget and keeping budgets, uh, know the deadline for the annual report, know how you account for expenses in a project, and also how to make progress plans. As a principal investigator, those are the things you need to take care of. You may delegate work packages or tasks to team members. But most funders, like the Research Council or the EU or just an the NGO, they have tedious report schedules and forms. And most institutions demand that you follow your budget strictly and account for all the expenses with our receipts. And in addition to these administrative skills, you need to be able to have human resource responsibilities for the people who are working in your team. That means sometimes they cry on your shoulder, 
Sometimes they ask for leave, sometimes they get pregnant, and sometimes they have uh, breakdowns, and you need to be able also to help them through those types of crises and share happy times with them. And of course, when you are a principal investigator or a senior researcher or a teacher, you need to be able to know how to supervise people as a postdoc, which is the next step in the academic ladder. Uh, you should already now start thinking about associate and professional competence and to find out what do you need to become a professor. And to be eligible for an associate professor position, you should at least have supervised master students to a completed master's project. And as a full professor, almost invariably, you need to have supervised at least one candidate to a PhD. That is, you're not going to write another PhD because you already did one, but you're going to help somebody else to do it. Maybe you will not even be paid to supervise. You just do it because you need that on your CV. Supervision is not is to be a guide. It's not to be a dictator. It's to be a supportive senior, but not a mother. It's someone who can say positive things and negative things without inflating or destroying people's self-esteem. And one advice that I often give to fresh supervisors is that if you have to convey a negative message, start with a positive. And then afterwards say, on the other hand, or by the way, um, there's also something here that is a bit negative. You're great, but you need to improve on that and that. That makes it much better than to say, wow, now you did this one. We just have to throw away. Don't say that. So supervision. And then again, the higher up on the ladder you get in the academic climb, uh, you need to be able to review. You review what other people write. It is sometimes fun, sometimes boring. Sometimes uh, you sit with a stack of papers that you need to read through before the deadline. Um, you should not rewrite people's articles nor should you ask them to do something else. You should guide them to stay within the limits of what they've been doing and be fair. A lot of relatively poor drafts can develop into good articles, but it, they need work. New journals really want to publish. So you have to be carefully choosing new journals, both for reviewing and for publishing. Good journals do not have a 99% acceptance rate. So if the, the journal that you're reviewing for want you to accept everything, then rethink where you want to put your effort. And then, of course, again, funding agencies may not just want to look at your own application. They may want you to review other people's applications and suggest which ones should get funding and which ones shouldn't. And try also to be fair there. Don't say no to a proposal that actually is very good just because it's competitive with your own activity. Be fair when you review applicants. Oh, and then you need to be somebody who has great ideas and can move science forward. And that you can only get to if you talk with people. If you sit in your office or only read internet, you will not have the greatest ideas on what you need in the world. You need to go out and be in the world at large. You need to have idea creation workshops, talk to people, talk to users talk to people who have experienced specific things, work in new teams, be multidisciplinary. Science should have some impact and that impact is up to you to find out about and describe your impact, describe why you think your science is going to make a difference because then you're much more likely to have fun when you're doing it. So for instance, you may want to do innovations in a nursing home. I found this one in my mother's nursing home. So, Press button one for potty, two for sleeping pills, and three for going to the toilet. This is just a joke. Future in nursing science. Eventually, if you get a position where you are uh, for a period of time employed in an academic institution, you need to learn how to teach. Uh, if you want to teach, you should start slow. Teach at small scale, but do teach. Teach something that you know so that you can free yourself from boring and crowded slides. Um, teaching is best if you know what you're going to talk about and then you can get your knowledge across to people by using slides, your body, your language. 
sometimes examples, sometimes anecdotes. And take a course in pedagogy as soon as you can, because teaching is not just standing on the catheter and uh, reading from slides. Teaching is much, much more than that. And in those courses, you learn also to be um, renew yourself in teaching, group teaching, uh, self uh, exercises, and uh, taking feedback and, and things like that. So eventually you qualify as a teacher. There are, there are formal qualifications to be able to teach in the university and you need to reach those formal qualifications. And please, if you teach, ask the students for feedback and be able to take that feedback. If they say you're boring, then try to get less boring. If they, if they say you're great, don't float on it, but improve even so. Um, students who listen to you are the ones that uh, are the recipients of your messages and they can always uh, give you good instructions about how to improve. So here I am as a teacher. Eventually, you may also want to look at yourself as a policymaker. Policymakers are people who translate science to action. And it's difficult, but it's important. I have been a policymaker for years and years, and I've uh, specifically worked on policymaking for women's health in Norway. Uh, policymakers do not want confidence intervals in three decimals. Actually, nobody wants three decimals. Um, so be careful that you cut your decimals, even in the future. But don't formulate unrealistic policies or draft too elaborate policy shifts from a small research article. Be fair to the policies. If you cannot formulate policies yourself, then you can become a lobbyist for the cases that you believe in. People like to listen to evidence. Don't be shy, but don't be the one that knows everything better either. Listen and formulate, listen and formulate. Policies can be formed from your own research, but you can also use other people's summary research. You can use uh, other people's input to formulate policy. So there you're allowed to go beyond your own work. You can draw upon the work of others. And that's my advice. It is writing skills, communication skills, media skills, grant writing skills, and administrative skills, supervision skills, review skills, idea creation, teaching, and policy. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Johanna Sundby from the University of Oslo. Thank you very much for sharing of your wealth of experience. We so much appreciated you taking time to share this with us. Have a good day, all of you.